Hi, this is Stephanie Miller from The Stephanie Miller Show. Please enjoy this exclusive clip from my show on Political Voices Network. No, it's a five alarm fire and you're like America's firefighters. I don't know what to say. This latest, I, oh, what the heck is that? All right, that's probably another five alarm fire. Okay, but Barb, talk to us about this latest bombshell out of Michigan. I mean, it's, oh Lordy, it, we have more tapes, right? It's on tape. Yes. And, you know, this was really a previously unknown, a, a, a phone call that occurred at the time um, of the 2020 election when, you know, Michigan was one of those swing states where fraud was alleged at the TCF center where votes were being counted with, you know, absolutely no evidence of fraud whatsoever. And now there's a recording of Donald Trump on the phone with the canvassers from Wayne County, which is the county where Detroit is located, pressuring them to rescind their certification they they had um already said they would certify wanted them to rescind their certification and on the phone saying do it and also on the phone call with trump and these two canvassers is rana romney mcdaniel from michigan and at the time the chair of the republican national committee so really a bombshell you know verbal testimony is one thing and can be valuable to prosecutors but when you have it on tape, it becomes such powerful evidence. It's really hard to run from that. Barb, what a lot of lay people would wonder is why why is this only coming out now? Does Jack Smith already have this? Do you think? I, I don't know. And I don't know who the source of the recording is. You know, it is attributed to um, anonymous sources. But the Detroit News reporter said he listened to the recording. So it certainly exists. Yeah. I imagine it's somebody who was on the call, right? Um, I, I would think that if I were getting a call from Donald Trump, I might be inclined to record it just because yeah. uh, who knows what he might say in, you know, in Michigan, as long as one party um, consents to the recording. So yourself, uh, it's legal to record a, a phone call without even notifying the other person. So uh, it would be legal to record a phone call. So my hunch is that it's one of the two canvassers who's on the call, probably worried about, oh, man, what's going to happen here? So it suggests to me that they're probably cooperated. Yeah. There's some talk about, you know, should they be charged with a crime or something for participating in this? Um, my, my guess is they're cooperating. They either shared it with the Attorney General Dana Nessel of the state of Michigan, who's been investigating the fake electors, yeah. or shared it with Jack Smith, who, you know, I, I know sometimes people are frustrated with the, the, the pace of investigations, but this is a good example of sort of the unknown people you have to talk to mm -hmm. to gather all the evidence, both incriminating and exonerating, you know, to find out is there more to the story here? So this is when you turn over every stone, you find out all of these little details. So I don't know why it became public at this moment. Yeah. I mean, somebody leaked it to the press. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's because it gets turned over to defendants in discovery. Um, so I don't know why it's become public now. Yeah. But my guess is it's somebody who's on the call who recorded it knowing that, Someday I might want to share this with the world because some, yeah. some, something that Trump does. You, yeah, you wonder <laughs> how, many in the crosshairs. State, how many more states might this, we yes. you know, right. We don't know who, how many people recorded yeah. things and how many states. We know Georgia now, we know Michigan. Um, it's interesting, that part of the reporting, uh, Barb, tends to uh, go to what you just said. The canvassers left the meeting without signing, you, you know, the, the mm -hmm. statement, which is what McDaniel and... Uh, um, uh, Trump requested the following day they unsuccessfully attempted to rescind their votes in favor of certification, filing legal affidavits claiming they were pressured. Well, yeah. that would kind of go to your point that they're probably cooperating because they're they would be in trouble, right? Yeah, I, I think so. They filed affidavits that appear to be false, and so um, they face potential, you know, criminal exposure for um, submitting a false statement, possibly, you know, violation of duties of office. And so that's the kind of leverage that prosecutors will often use to say, you know, either we won't charge you at all, or if we charge you, we will seek leniency. Um, you know, like sort of what we're seeing in Georgia, where some of the defendants have entered guilty pleas in exchange for a sentence of probation, but they have to cooperate. So um, when you have some criminal exposure like yeah. that, it often so, um, provides a clarity of the mind. Yeah. So. This could go to our, so let's talk about, I just played Judge Ludwig, so let's talk about the, the Colorado decision, because, you know, this goes to the argument some people are making <laughs> that he needs to be convicted of Not necessarily convicted, but, but, the, I, but I've heard that there's an argument that, that the proper due process wasn't given. But, but Barb, wasn't it? Didn't they? Ludwig said it was. 
that yes. Lovick says so it I was, think, get, that that's what they determined, that an insurrection had occurred. There was, you know, Trump was allowed to, he, he just didn't present any evidence, right, Barb, in the Colorado? Just give us your take on, on the Colorado decision. Yes. So I think this due, due process argument is either um, an ignorant one or a deliberately misleading one. Um, this is not a criminal prosecution. Right. Um, if it were a criminal prosecution, his liberty would be at stake and he would have to have all the rights a criminal defendant gets, you know, uh, right to cross-examine yeah. witnesses and uh, due process and uh, all of those things. Instead, this there was a, a, a trial. There yeah. were witnesses who came forward and fact-finding was done and that is the process that is due. A judge has to make a finding that Trump engaged in insurrection um, and he did that, uh, I'm sorry, she did that at this trial where um, witnesses testified from police officers who were there that day to uh, Congress members who were there that day. Um, the text messages, the, the the tweets, I'm sorry, that Donald Trump posted about Mike Pence that uh, poured fuel on the fire. And so the judge made a finding that there was an insurrection. And then that's what the court upheld on appeal. And so I think that's a silly argument. I think there are genuine legal arguments here. You know, this is a relatively untested provision of the Constitution. I think, um, you know, whether whether what he did is sufficient to count as engaging in insurrection is a fair question. I think whether the provision is self-executing or requires some other enabling legislation by Congress is a fair question. Um, but the due process argument, I think, is not a fair argument. Yeah, well, that's what, I mean, isn't it, I, I, I'm, what, am I, what do I know? I'm a dummy, but isn't it, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it, you know, sort of, not analogous, but I mean, you know, the judge, obviously, in the E. Jean Carroll matter, um, you know, said this is for all intents and purposes this is rape you know so i mean that, that's yeah. all i'm saying is he was adjudicated to be a rapist and i think this yeah. th it, there was a, a, a proceeding here and he was adjudicated to be an insurrectionist in this yeah and what i think is really important is to think whether it's a civil matter or a criminal matter in a criminal matter you get all kinds of extra due process because your liberty is at stake you might go to prison that's not what's at stake here this is a yeah. civil matter and so yes there must be findings in court um, and those happened uh, in in the way they're supposed to happen in a civil case. And so that's why I think that argument is not particularly persuasive. You retweeted uh, your friend Joyce Vance, who uh, of the um, very obviously athletically uh, inferior. Right. Uh, yeah. Tied. Well, I mean, they're just Alabama. 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 They're just Alabama. Alabama. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, blue. What, you got a Tide? You got a Tide member there? <laughs> no, not no, 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 oh, no, no, no. Oh, just, just Joyce Vance. That's we're, all. We're all Wolverine this yeah. morning. We're 100% oh, Wolverine. Go blue. Wolverines. Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, but she tweeted a judge is being asked to disqualify Georgia Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones from holding office because of Jones' participation as an elector for Donald Trump in 2020. And you just said the ripples from the Colorado decision to uh, uh, DQ Trump will soon be a tidal waves unless SCOTUS takes up this case quickly. I mean, they're going to have to take it up quickly, aren't they? Isn't January, what is it, 4th, 5th is the the ballot in Colorado? Yes, I think so. Um, because if this stands, um, we're going to see other states try to get Trump off the ballot. And not just Trump, right? Anybody yeah. else who participated. As they uh, should. State, state officials, members of Congress, all, all of them. So, um, I do think the court will take the case, and I do think they'll take it quickly. The um, the court did stay the execution of its decision until January 4th, and the reason for that date is because January 5th is the date by which the Secretary of State in Colorado must certify the ballot for the primary, um, and Colorado's a Super Tuesday state. That's March 5th, so, you know, two months to kind of get the ballot together. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, it's possible that the Supreme Court could extend the time a little bit. The U.S. Supreme Court will say, yeah. yes, we're going to take this case and we're going to stay the Colorado order a little bit longer. But they can't do it too much longer if they want to uh, include Trump on the primary ballot there. So um, I could see, you know, maybe giving a few weeks in January to get brief submitted and oral argument heard and a decision made. Yeah. But I think it's got to happen within the month of mm -hmm. January. If you were a betting woman, say, betting against, uh, say, Alabama, would you, uh, <laughs> well, what do you, I mean, I, cause nobody knows the makeup of this Supreme Court. What do you think? What would you say? Yeah, you no, that's a really good point. I, I think a few things are at play here. One is I hear people saying, well, they're all in the bag for Trump. So of course they're going to rule in his favor. I don't think that's right. I think that they are a, a very conservative majority court. They have a very conservative worldview. And so when it comes to questions like abortion and other things, 
this majority takes a very conservative view of, of uh, legal issues. But I don't think they're MAGA. I don't think they're pro-Trumpers per se. In fact, if anything, they might want to distance themselves yeah. from Donald Trump. So I don't think that we should assume that. I think they will look at the Constitution. I am one, one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, courts aren't really supposed to do this. They're supposed to decide questions based purely on the law. But I've been reading an awful lot lately about Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who was much more of a pragmatist, Mm -hmm. she had been a politician, and she was of the view that the court should not get too far ahead of popular vote and the mood of the country. And so I wonder if they would be concerned that removing Trump from the ballot would be so uh, incredibly divisive and consequential that that might tend to put a thumb on the scale. But legally, I think it's a really close question. I think you know, you look at it. Did he engage in insurrection? See, kind of seems like it. Is he an officer of the United States? Cer- certainly seems like it to me. Yeah. And, you know, the uh, people who uh, ratified the 14th Amendment wanted to keep those treasonous traitors out of positions of power who had participated in the Civil War as Confederates. And uh, Trump seems c- certainly just as disloyal as they were. So mm. if you look at it on his face, like, there's some pretty good legal arguments here. So yeah. I really don't know. But I think those are all factors to think about. What would have been nice if Sandra Day O'Connor, if she was a big fan of the popular vote, would have allowed it to you know, continue to be counted because uh, Al yes, Gore likely won the popular true. vote. But I don't, it's not that I hold a grudge yeah, no. forever. Uh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Barb, uh, Katie Fang tweeted uh, Trump in an attempt to avoid going to trial against uh, Gigi and Carroll in just a few weeks, moves for an emergency stay, claiming the issue of presidential <laughs> immunity warrants the stay as he pursues going to SCOTUS. And you just said, how do his lawyers keep a straight face? Oh. I mean, <laughs> Right now, now, of course, he's like, oh, no, 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 slow down, Supreme Court, don't. I mean, right. clearly this is his only legal tactic is delay, right? And hoping yeah, he gets it, back it really in. is. And even the E. Jean Carroll case, I mean, come on, you know, like, well, I'm so busy in these other courts, which I'm at, where I'm asking for delay, you know, until after the election that I can't possibly have this E. Jean Carroll trial in January. Uh, it, it really is just absurd. It's ridiculous. He has different teams of lawyers. There are plenty of lawyers to go around to handle all these cases. Um, and the one that I find it particularly rich is the request that the Supreme Court not handle the immunity question, right. which is his own motion. He filed that right. motion and said, you should dismiss this case because I'm immune. Well, if you really believe you're immune, well, let's go already and make yeah. that decision. So the idea that that should be delayed is is really just hypocritical yeah. on its face. Yeah. Speaking of ridiculous lawyer, uh, Rudy Giuliani has filed for bankruptcy in the least <laughs> yeah. shocking story of the morning. Um, yeah. That's not going to get him out of this, though, is it? As everybody, I think, is saying, you, you know, I, I, I mean, it's obviously unsurprising that he did it, but because uh, the judge ruled that he must start paying as soon as possible. Tell us what happens now. Yeah. So, you know, he was uh, assessed a hundred and forty eight million dollar judgment. And one thing that his lawyer, the lawyers for Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman did that was really savvy is when they got the judgment, they received language in that judgment that when Rudy Giuliani um, defamed them, he did so willfully, intentionally and maliciously. And that language is important because that language makes it undischargeable in bankruptcy. There's a certain provision that uses that exact same language that for intentional torts that are intentional, willful and malicious, they are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. You can't just write it off. So he may, you know, discharge his other debts, you know, that he owes to creditors and yeah. whoever else, lenders and others. But this debt will follow him for the rest of his life. And so they um, now that they have that judgment in hand, they can use it to attach his bank accounts, um, his real estate and any wages that come into him. So if he gets earnings from a podcast appearance or somebody yeah. joked on Twitter, you know, uh, royalties from the Borat movie, whatever it is, <laughs> those will go to them as opposed to Giuliani. Now, they may never get the $148 million, yeah. but they can't get every penny that he earns. By the way, speaking of E. Jean Carroll and dumb legal strategies, you're hearing that, right? That Trump bragging about his wealth in the one case mm-hmm. might yes. screw him over in yeah, the E. Jean right. Carroll case because, you know, they wanted, I mean, there's he's 91 right indictment so of course he's brown yeah. to like I exactly mean, right yeah. in, in uh, this new york civil case it's all about how uh valuable his assets are right and then in other places um yeah. you know I, I i'm broke well you know which is it let's you know don't don't you think they read the the uh, yeah. for the pleadings in various cases yeah exactly barb mcquade one of america's uh firefighters yes, in this is. in this fascism fire yeah. I, I you know what i pictured that you all live together in like a firehouse like and you're like glenn Kushner, <laughs> get down the pole i've got a stephanie rule hit Hurry yeah. Up. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a fun idea <laughs> 
Mm-mm, there it is, my first drink of the day, Z-Biotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic. Many of you know my, my story. I stopped drinking wine for three years during COVID, during the lockdown as part of a health reset. Now I drink wine in moderation, but this is an amazing new product. I've always believed in probiotics. And Z-Biotics, check this out. You drink just one of these. It's the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. I am using this and I feel great in the morning. I don't have to worry if I have an extra glass of wine, I still feel great in the morning. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. I've always had acid reflux problems. It is this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. All I know is it works. It is Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic. Go to zbiotics.com slash political voices or scan the QR code on the screen right now.